All right, let's get in the Word, Dub Westgate Church. All of you here in the auditorium and online, open your Bibles. If you have a printed Bible, turn to Matthew 5, put a marker there, and then to go to Genesis 39. Matthew 5 and Genesis 39. We're going to be starting in Genesis 39, so if you have an electronic Bible, just go straight to Genesis 39. Uh, this is going to be a, um, a hard-hitting message, so... Uh, Buckle your seatbelt, um, get ready for takeoff. Um, we're currently in a sermon series called Dream to Destiny, and this series, of course, is based on the life of Joseph uh, from the Old Testament in the Bible. And as we've been saying every week, but I really want you to get this, every person, we believe, has a dream from God. God has a dream for your life. And he wants to instill that into your heart. And every person, listen, every person has a destiny that God wants you to fulfill. But the, the one extremely important word that can prevent us from fulfilling that, that destiny is the word character. 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 God wants to build character in your life. So Joseph had to go through and pass these 10 tests along the way as God built character in his life before he could fulfill the destiny and the call that God had on his life. And so we talked about the, the pride test first week, then we talked about the pit test, uh, we talked about the palace test last week. Uh, this is number four, this is the purity test, the purity test. And so Genesis 39, starting in verse 7, says, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife Okay, remember, Joseph was a slave. He was sold into slavery in Potiphar's household in Egypt. Potiphar was a very wealthy man, had many servants. He was the captain of the guard. So it came to pass that his master's wife, Potiphar's wife, cast longing eyes upon Joseph. I want you to notice that she cast longing eyes on Joseph, lustful eyes. Remember that phrase. And she said to him, lie with me quite brazen. But he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in this house. He has committed all that he has into my hand. There is no one greater in his house than me, nor has he kept anything back from me but you. So he's saying, look, he trusts me this much. He gives me every, he doesn't even know what's going on in his house. He just, he just gives it all to my care. He's entrusted everything to me, except you, his wife, because you're his wife. How then could I do this great wickedness? I want you to notice that Joseph calls sexual immorality a great wickedness. Great wickedness. How could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So it was as she spoke to Joseph day by day, and I want you to notice this one. Look how incessantly the enemy attacks in this area. Incessant. She spoke to Joseph day by day that he did not heed her to lie with her or even to be with her. Verse 11, but it happened about this time Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was inside. So Joseph goes in, do his normal task. It so happens it's just the two of them in the house that day. Verse 12 says, she caught him by the garment and says, lie with me. But he left his garment and his hand and he fled and ran outside. I want you to notice he ran from sexual immorality. This is congruent with what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where it says, flee or run from sexual immorality. Run, don't walk. I want to show you uh, some things from sexual immorality, sexual impurity that can affect a person's life, uh, the person who might succumb to it. And I want to give you uh, some very, at the end, a very, very practical key at being able to overcome and to, and to stay pure in this area of your life. So here's number one. Impurity affects your family. Impurity affects your family. We know what happened to King David, 2 Samuel chapter 11. He fell morally. What happens next? Several of his kids fall in the next several chapters. David sowed the seeds for his family, and he reaped the fruit. In our story this morning, we have Joseph. He knew that it would affect his family. He knew that it would affect his destiny. He knew that it would impact his future if he fell 
in this area. Now, I want to deal with a lie that Satan tries to give each one of us. Here's what Satan tells many, 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 many believers regarding lust, and many believe it. He says this, as long as you don't transgress, it's okay. In other words, as long as you don't step over the line, as long as you never physically do this, it's not going to affect you, it's not going to affect your family, even though you allow this thought to enter your mind or this, these images to engage your eyes, it's not going to affect you. As long as you uh, ever hear, look but don't touch, it's a lie. It's a lie. Please understand, when the Bible talks about sin, it's talking about inward motivation and outward action, both. Very clearly, both. Now, I want to give you some words for this. A transgression would be an outward action if you've transgressed. The word transgress, if you look back at the original Hebrew, it literally means to step over a boundary line. So the best English word for this would be the word trespass. If a person steps over a boundary line onto somebody else's property, they're trespassing, right? So in the same way uh, that the word transgress uh, means that that's what that word means. It means to step over a boundary line. And the Bible then uses another word for sin other than transgress. It uses the word iniquity. Iniquity is an inward predisposition. Iniquity is, a, is an, an inward motivation, a motivation towards sin. And I, I, I want you to understand because people don't understand this. Uh, lust is, is iniquity. If lust is in our heart, it's iniquity. It's an inward predisposition towards sin. Transgression, then, would be the actual act of adultery or fornication. And, and by the way, if, if you read the Bible and your Bible version has fornication in it, if you don't know it, I was actually very interesting. I was listening to a podcast just this week. It was a secular podcast. It wasn't a, 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 a Christian one. And this word fornication came up. And, and the podcast host incorrectly defined fornication. He said, well, it's if you're married and you have sex outside of marriage. That's not true. It, it, that's adultery. Fornication is if you're unmarried and you're having sex outside of marriage. So and I remember one time I was doing premarital counseling with a couple, and uh, it came out that they had been engaged sexually. And so I said, uh, through the course of the counseling, I said, do you know what the word fornication means? They didn't. So I defined it for them. And so I said, do you know what the Bible says about that? And we read through every word on fornication. I think you have to use the New King James or something because other translations use other words. It was in the Bible, I forget how many times, a lot of times. So after we got done reading all those verses, they said, that's not a very good thing, is it? I said, no. We probably should stop that, shouldn't we? I said, yeah. Yeah, God's, God's not pleased by that. And so it was very interesting how people get these twisted ideas about what these words mean. Fornication is sexual activity outside of marriage. Adultery, obviously, is you're married and you engage sexually with someone other than your spouse. So the Bible uses the word iniquity to talk about this inward motivation that we have. And many people believe that as long as I don't transgress, I don't step over this boundary line, uh, we're going to be okay. Listen, the Bible doesn't say that the transgressions of the Father will be visited upon the children for the third or fourth generation. It says the iniquity, the iniquity of the fathers. In other words, if it's in your heart, if you're engaging and entertaining it in your heart, it will affect your family. You know, we even have a word for this or a phrase for this in the world. Not, it's not even necessarily a Christian saying. It's a, the, the saying goes like this. What the fathers or what the parents do in moderation, the next generation will do in excess. I bet most of you have heard that saying. And what it's saying is, if this thing's in your heart, the next generation is going to take it a whole lot further. So iniquity speaks to an inward motivation, transgression, again, outward movement or overt action. But, but please get this, if it's in your heart, it's going to affect your family. So don't, don't allow it to stay in your heart. And by the way, the Bible is so perfect. It just dovetails so amazingly. I want to read a verse from Isaiah. And, and, and remember this um, transgression, iniquity, inward motivation, outward action. L listen to Isaiah 53, 5. It's a Messianic prophecy. It says, he, Jesus, but he was wounded. Okay, a wound is an outward thing, right? 
someone strikes another person with a sword or something. They've got a wound. He was wounded uh, for our transgressions, the outward stuff. He was bruised. What's a bruise? It's an inward wound. It's a black and blue mark. He was bruised for our iniquities, the inward stuff. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. Jesus died to pay for both, to set us free from both. So again, impurity affects your family. Here's a number two. Impurity affects your faith. It's going to affect your faith. It's going to affect your walk with God. It not only affects uh, your walk with others, which it will, but it will affect your walk with God. I want to explain this in greater detail, and I want to use an, something very extremely practical here. There's this commonly held belief in society today, uh, and even in the church, where young people think this, if we are committed to one another, if we know we're going to get married anyhow one day, uh, what difference does a piece of paper make? Have you ever heard that? I sure have. This is a lie that the enemy tries to feed to many young believers today. He wants them to get their focus on the piece of paper. We love each other. We're committed to one another. We're going to get married anyway. anyway. So the enemy says, what does that piece of paper make? Obviously referring to the marriage license. Here's the answer, none. The piece of paper doesn't make any difference at all. It's not the piece of paper that makes the difference. It's the blessing of God that makes the difference. It's the blessing of God. And when God tells us not to do something, it's not because he doesn't want you to have fun. It's not because he's a prude. It's not because he wants to ruin your life. It's because he doesn't want your life to be destroyed. He has a better plan for your life. When we tell our children not to play in the traffic, it's not because we want to ruin their day. It's not because we're trying to keep them from having fun. It's because we do want them to have fun. And we know that if they're playing in, in traffic, putting themselves in danger, they're in, they're, they're in, they're in uh, the process of their own destruction. We want them to stay healthy and alive and be able to have fun in life. So when God says flee from sexual immorality, there is solid rationale for it. And I want to give you a couple of reasons why the Apostle Paul, I referred it to earlier, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 18, he says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sin is the person commits. It's a sin outside of the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. He's saying it's the most pernicious kind of sin, the most damaging, the most dangerous. You know, we like to say all sin is, is the same, you know, and so that would imply if I speed, I'm disobeying the law, that's bad, that's sin. If I murder someone, that's bad, it's all the same. It's really not. Um, I think that's pretty clear just by that example, but I can tell you when you're sinning sexually, you're sinning against your own body, the apostle Paul says, when you commit sexual sin, you will be affected. Your physical body will be negatively Im impacted. Your emotions will be negatively impacted. There will be a significant psychological impact that people so grossly underestimate. They, they cheapen themselves in their own eyes. They feel degraded. They walk away from those experiences hating themselves. And so they do it again to try to feel better about themselves. The, the, this horrible cycle the devil wants to get people on. I know what I'm talking about. I've counseled too many people. I'm so passionate about this this morning because I know it's true. You can, you can believe any lie you want of the enemy, but everything I'm telling you this morning, I know is true. It's in the Word of God, but, but even what confirms it more is my practical experience with people. Please, please, please. Don't let the enemy lie to you anymore that, that you don't, there won't be any impact. Second thing is sexual sin opens the door to numerous other sins. One would be deception, manipulation, lying, uh, these sorts of things, because sexual immorality opens the door to, to so many other sins. So much heartache, untold heartache, unforeseen circumstances. King David, when he was sexually immoral, ended up committing murder to try to cover his tracks. You never thought that was going to be the result. So when you have extramarital sex, you learn how to live and be in deception. It affects your family. It affects your relationship with the Lord. It affects your view of yourself. You cheapen yourself, as I said earlier. Let me give you an example. Let's just say there's this young couple heading out on a date. And mom asks, uh, where are you guys going tonight? Oh, we're going to sneak off somewhere and have sex. I don't think so. 
I don't think that's going to be the answer. So there's this deceptiveness comes in. Oh, uh, you know, she says, you know, that's great, kids. Sure, just be home by 11. I don't think. When the one young couple comes home then, she says, where were you? What did you do? Now, Now she has to lie. There's a a deceptive spirit that begins to form in us that affects us very negatively in these situations. And and when this happens, we come to church then, you know, with our hands raised to God, but our hearts closed to Him, because we know we're living a lie. And it doesn't matter how bad you want to worship God, how bad you want God, you're living a lie, and you know it, and God knows it, and it, it cuts off that communication, that relationship with God. And if you're married, sexually, sexual impurity will dramatically impact your marriage. And I'm not just talking about the overt act. I'm talking about pornography. I'm talking about sexual fantasies and so on. Because here's what will happen. Listen to me. Just listen to me. You will develop an appetite for something that God never intended for you to have. You will develop an appetite for sneaking around, engaging in forbidden sexual fulfillment. And listen... It will become part of the rush for you, and you'll need that, and then the the right way, the godly way of doing it won't seem fulfilling anymore. Oh, man, this is so true. This is so true. And if you're married, then your spouse suddenly doesn't meet your needs anymore. There just isn't that intrigue. If you you aren't married, when you get married, then suddenly the sex isn't as exciting anymore because now it's missing the sneaking around part. That, that sort of grasping of the apple you're not supposed to eat kind of thing. And so then you try to bring some things into your marriage, ungodly things into your marriage to try to spice it up, but that doesn't work either because you've begun to feed a beast that is insatiable. And that you need to remember. It is an insatiable beast. And by the way, this goes both ways. A lot of times for men, it's sex. For women, it, it could be romance. A lot of women like to read romance novels or watch seemingly innocuous movies, but they're not harmless because you are creating extremely unrealistic expectations for and an appetite for romance that they will never experience in their marriage relationship or any other relationship because it's not real. It's Hollywood. And you get this fantasized, you know, romantic notion of what marriage is supposed to look like, and it'll never be that because what they're depicting in a Hollywood script is not something you're ever going to experience in real life. Uh, When people are surveyed about their deepest needs, men will often rank sex either number one or two. Women will rank it around number 13, just behind gardening. (laughs) Um... Young people, um, listen to me. Here's why premarital sex is so damaging. Watch this scenario. A man will begin to talk uh, to a woman in the office. He'll begin to flirt just a little bit. And you know what happens? He'll get an adrenaline rush because it is fulfilling an appetite. This appetite was one he didn't even know he has, but it was created by you before he ever got married. And she, the, the woman in this a blossoming new relationship, unhealthy relationship. She likes it because she's being pursued. She's being romanced. And it eventually turns into an affair. You know what they'll have to do? They have to sneak around. And so he is fulfilling an appetite that the two of you created before you ever got married that he didn't even know was being created in him. And then the next step is as this affair goes on, uh, he begins to feel with her and this sneaking around, this sneakiness, it's fun, it's exciting. He begins to feel with her what he used to feel with you before you got married. And he associates that feeling with love. Because all sexual immorality has as its root deception. He'll begin to believe that he loves her. Because it, it's that feeling he associated with love. And he begins to believe that he, he loves her, not you. Because he's deceived. Let me tell you how stupid this cycle is with Satan. He'll divorce you, marry her. Will that solve everything? Of course not, because now he doesn't have to sneak around anymore. He's married to her. So in a few years, he's going to say to her, it's not like it used to be. And so he gets a wandering eye 
and starts to cycle all over again and begins to sneak around again. This is why you see people so many times married multiple times, because they're trying to fulfill and satisfy an insatiable appetite that was created before they ever got married. So young people, please understand and know there are future implications and penalties for sexual immorality that you will never know in the moment. God knows, and He loves you, and He doesn't want to see you harmed. So He gave us this book that we call the Bible that gives you a blueprint to live a happy, joy-filled, successful, complete life. When God says, flee sexual immorality, it's not because He's a prude because he loves you. He doesn't want to see your life destroyed. He doesn't want to see your children's lives destroyed. He doesn't want to see you hit on the road. And so he has a better plan for you. Now, some of you this morning may say, you're starting to feel uneasy maybe because you say, well, we engaged in sexual activity before marriage. We're guilty of what you're talking about. Uh, We've never been with anybody else, but, but we had premarital sex. What do we do? It's very simple. In this case, you do treat it like every other sin. You confess it, you repent of it, and and you ask God to break any bondages that were, were, were formed there. Break every chain, as we talked about earlier. He can do it. He will do it. You're not in bondage to that if you confess it, repent of it, and turn and go a different way. So don't don't think you're in bondage to it. Too often that we try to bury it, pretend it never happened, ignore it. The two of you need to confess it to each other for what it was, sin. We sinned. You don't need to broadcast it. You need to take out an ad. You don't need to put it on Facebook and boost it. You don't need to do that. Just confess it. Perhaps go to a trusted advisor, a counselor, a Christian counselor, maybe a pastor, and say, look, we want you to agree with us that this thing's broken out of our lives. When you draw that line in the sand, say, we've broken this thing. It no longer has power over us. Then uh, you've, you've canceled the enemy's ability to continue to afflict your marriage. You don't want to leave any open doors to Satan in your marriage. But what's awesome about this is God is the ultimate restorer. Joel 2 says he will restore the years the locusts have eaten. In other words, that season of walking out from under God's protection, of sowing seeds that lead to destruction, God can restore that. He can cancel any generational curses that the enemy is trying to establish in your lineage. And by the way, that's why we so strongly uh, like to do things, see things like our, our cleansing stream classes that we do periodically. Uh, we have a good one coming up called Deeper Roots. It's talking about emotional health. When we offer these things, it's not because we need more classes and more things to do. It's because we want to see you all set free walking in wholeness. So take, we, in February, we're coming up, we have Deeper Roots. Take that class. Engage with it. All right, number three, impurity affects your future. Here's what Satan probably told Joseph. Think about this. I'll bet Satan said to Joseph, dude, you've got no future. Do you realize you're a slave? (laughs) All the dreams that you had, they're not going to come to fruition. God's not going to be able to use you. Your brothers thwarted God's plan for your life. Why don't you just indulge? You've got no future. Let Let me just pause to say this, and I really want you to get this. There is only one person who can thwart God's plans for your life, and that's you. Only one person can screw up, mess up, thwart God's plans for your life, and that's you. Not the brothers who sell you into slavery, not the enemy who brings affliction against you. Nothing can thwart God's plans for your life but you. You're fully capable of it. In this situation, Joseph knew that if he made the wrong choice for his life, he he would be thwarting God's plans for his life. Now, let me be clear. I'm not saying that if you've fallen, and I alluded to this earlier, I'm not saying if you've fallen, if you've made the wrong choice, you can never fulfill God's purpose for your life. Not at all, because God can redeem even our worst mistakes. If we come before him, if we come before him in brokenness and humility, he can redeem it. But we can put huge detours in our life. Take take long way around the mountain that we didn't have to take. And we, or we could even train wreck our lives if we refuse to walk in repentance and humility. And by the way, 
This is one of the reasons I'm so passionate about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, inner healing ministries, which I just talked about, uh, freedom ministries that we do. I want every person to, uh, somewhere along the line, participate and get involved with one of these uh, freedom classes or inner healing ministries that we do. We offer this stuff, uh, Isaiah 61 team ministry. We offer this stuff almost every year. We're rolling something out. Every fall, we usually do a, a, we roll out new term groups with something like that. Every person should engage in this. And by the way, remember, I said the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Remember, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. We, I frequently offer invitations for people to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know that Jesus told his disciples in the upper room, don't leave. He had already given them the Great Commission saying, go into all the world, teach this to all people, baptizing them, making, making them your disciples. But then he said, but wait, not yet. You're not ready yet. You need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, nothing changed my life to walk in holiness and purity and power like the baptism of the Holy Spirit did. And, and, and so no one could ever convince me that it's not powerful because I know it is. I've experienced it. The Bible says so, but I've experienced it personally. It's life-changing. Just want to reinforce again, if you've fallen, it doesn't mean you can't fulfill your destiny. You can indeed be set free and redeemed and, re and, and redeemed. That's a good word. But if you continue to walk in brokenness, if you continue to have sexual broken years life, you will not fulfill the destiny that God has on your life. So sexual impurity affects your family, affects your faith. Uh, it, it also affects your future. What's the answer? What's the solution? Well, please be encouraged. It's not that difficult. God takes the complex sometimes, just makes it so simple. Just, it's, so, it's so easy sometimes. So in light of that, I've got a point number four surprise for you. You thought number three were done, right? Nope, this is a four-pointer. Impurity begins with the eyes. Impurity begins with the eyes. Remember that passage we read in the beginning of the message? What did, what did Potiphar's wife do? She, she cast longing eyes on Joseph. You know why she had lust in her heart? Because she allowed herself the first look. And then she considered the possibilities in her mind, and then lust settled into her heart. See, it's the, it's the eye, goes to the mind, lust goes to the heart. Joseph, it tells us, was a handsome dude. She began to look at him in a certain way. Here is a ridiculously simple solution. Don't look at attractive people. <laughs> Except when I'm preaching. <laughs> boo! Boo! It was bad. Just don't look. It's called bouncing the eyes. And it's easier than you might think. I remember one time many years ago, I'd been learning this principle, bouncing your eyes. I was driving on Route 501 through Nesville. One of the worst things a person could ever do. And uh, so I'm driving through Nashville, and of course I'm not driving, I'm sitting in traffic. And uh, so we're, we're stuck there, and suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, something caught my eye, and here comes a, a female jogger coming down the sidewalk. And she, it would appear, was quite proud of the way nature had endowed her. And she was putting it all on full display. And so I was so encouraged by my immediate reaction as soon as I saw what was happening, I immediately averted my gaze. It was just a, a knee-jerk reaction, taught by practice, because that wouldn't normally be a man's reaction, would it now, men? And so I averted my gaze, but what was so funny, so telling, as I averted my gaze and looked straight ahead in traffic, every head, every car, as far as I could see, man or woman, every head was turning. Some of them, 90 degrees. <laughs> Neck started to break, you know. Every head turning as far as they could turn. It, 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 was, it was fascinating. But here's the thing about that situation. I did not have to worry about where my mind would go. I didn't have to concern myself about sin entering my heart. I simply averted my eyes. How ridiculously simple. End of issue. Now, I love to say my response has been that way every time since that happened. And I'm batting a thousand on this, but that wouldn't be true. 
Every now and then it's a struggle. But, but here's the thing. I've trained myself not to look, and you can too. It really doesn't take that long to form a habit. Just, just be super proactive about it, super proactive for a month. Every time there's an opportunity to engage your eyes, you immediately divert. It doesn't take long to form a habit. You might be surprised how quickly you can form a good habit. In fact, I even have this inner dialogue I do with myself. Um, and I say this. It's kind of funny. It's kind of embarrassing. But I say this. That's not going to do me any good. Whatever that thing is that's tempting my eyes. That's not going to do me any good. And, and see, I don't like engaging in self-destructive behavior. Seems somewhat illogical to me, doesn't it? And I know that if I engage, if I indulge my eyes right now, I know where that goes, and I know it's self-destructive behavior. Why would I want to do such a stupid thing? I don't want to do such a stupid thing, so I'm not going to indulge my eyes. It's, it's pretty simple, really, this thing. And listen to what Jesus says uh, to back this up. Uh, turn to Matthew 5, if you've marked that. Matthew 5, <clears throat> verse 28. Matthew 5, 28 is in the Sermon on the Mount. But I say to you that whoever looks, looks, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, there are two things I want you to notice about this Scripture. It blows away the Pharisees' idea that if I don't transgress, I haven't sinned. People say, well, I haven't stepped over the line, so it's not sin. Jesus says, no, 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 no. If it's in your heart, it's sin. I want you to notice in the Old Testament, all the rules, nearly all of the rules and regulations you read in the Old Testament, they had to do with what you did, actions, overt actions. You know what Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount? I think it's seven times he said, you have heard it said. Or it is written, this or that, and he quotes the Old Testament, and he says, but I say to you, and he raises the bar. It's not just the overt action, it's what's in our minds and what's in our hearts that causes the sin. But I want you to remember the, pro pro the, the progression Jesus just says. Whoever looks to lust has committed adultery. See the progression? Look, lust, adultery. If you don't want to commit adultery, if you don't want lust to reside in your heart, don't look. It's that simple. Looking empowers lusting. And I don't, I don't look at pornography. I never have. I don't. I won't do it. I remember years ago, before the internet screening got much better, years ago, when I was in my real estate office, I used to get these emails. I don't know how they got my email address, but I get these emails of straight-up pornography. I don't get that. I never get those anymore. But I used to get them back before the filtering was good. First thing I did, that thing would pop up. First thing I did, click the delete button. Not, not even going to take a second look because I, I refuse to take that first look because I know how pernicious and how um, horrifically damaging pornography addiction can be. And because I refused to ever take the first look, I never had to go through the terribly painful process of confessing a pornography addiction to my wife because I refused to take the first look. It isn't that complicated. When I was in the real estate business, uh, affairs and divorces were very common. Uh, but in all my years in the business, I never once was tempted to have an affair because I wasn't looking for it. As far as I know, a woman never made a pass at me. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, I certainly can understand that one. <laughs> well, thank you. I'd like to think maybe they'd want to, but, but no, I, I was never looking for it. Now, it's possible that maybe a woman cast a lustful eye at me somewhere along the line. I'd like to think so. No, no, I wouldn't like to think that. No, 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 I wouldn't. I wouldn't like to think that. But I wouldn't know because I wasn't looking for it. I wasn't searching for it. I wasn't looking for it. Uh, Mem and I will not go see a movie that we know has nudity in it. Many believers do. They think it's not a big deal. But you're deceiving yourself. Because in your heart, you actually know better. You know it stirs something up in you that's not healthy. 
So I'm making the point that impurity begins with the eyes. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, uh, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body is full of life. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be filled with darkness. Then the light within you is darkness. How great is that darkness? I'm telling you, looking empowers lust. Do you know what the rules are for an alcoholic um, to, to stay clean? You can't have one drink. You have that first drink, and all of a sudden, you're on that slippery slope, and a torrent is unleashed, and you fall right back into it again. It is that same thing with lust and pornography and sexual fantasies. And by the way, if you're listening this morning, uh, and you know that this is an area you've struggled in, you can't take even one look. You know what I'm talking about. You know this is true. You know it. Because it stirs something up in you. And so you really need to be accountable in this area of your life. Man, do you want to have victory in this area of your life? Try this one out. Confess it to your wife. Whoa, somebody just said. Couldn't do that. Now confess it to your wife. Yeah, you can have another man that, that holds you accountable. That's a healthy thing. That's a good thing. But confess it to your wife. When you can talk about this stuff in your relationship, it will rise to a level that it's never been before, and you will experience freedom. Let, let, me, let me give you two very simple words for marriage enrichment. Struggle together. Struggle together. We're the body of Christ. By the way, if we get a splinter in our finger, we don't cut the finger off. We try to remove that splinter. We might put an antiseptic on it. We might bandage it. If you're in the body and you've got a splinter in your finger of lust, share it with someone. Don't put it on Facebook. Share it with someone. We're not going to cut you off. We're not going to cut that finger off. We're going to try to help you get healed. Get that splinter out. Get that thing will heal right over and be restored. But don't let that, don't let that splinter uh, fester. Confess it to your spouse. Confess it to someone else who can help you get free. Oh, by the way, women, women, let me talk to you. Please, 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 please hear me, women. Will you please not condemn him? When he admits his struggle, will you please not feel insecure? Listen to me. He's got a lust problem, not a love problem. Lust is never love. It's two very different things. He struggles with lust. He doesn't love me anymore. That's not true. He's got a lust problem. Listen to me. Potiphar's wife didn't love Joseph. If she had loved him, she wouldn't have let him sit in jail for two or three years or however long it was. She didn't love him. She lusted for him. And young ladies, when a man says to you, if you love me, you'll give this to me. Listen to me. The very thing that, that you give him to try to keep him will be the very thing that causes you to lose him in the long term. Because just as I talked about earlier, you'll create that appetite that can't be satisfied. Satan's a liar. He is a liar. Believe me on this. I've seen it. I've seen and learned a few things along the way. I'm speaking truth to you, young ladies, this morning. Don't give that thing to him that he desires so you can keep him. Won't work. By the way, have you ever heard the, the truism, anything you keep hidden in darkness loses? I'm sorry. Anything you keep hidden in darkness has a grip on you. Anything you shine the light on loses its grip on you. I will guarantee you that one's true. Guarantee you that one's true. If you struggle with lust, but you keep it hidden in darkness, you refuse to talk about it, it will grip you like a steel vice. But you shine light on it, you reveal it, you talk about it, it will lose that vice-like grip on you faster than you might think. Let me assure you, Satan loves to work in darkness. So husbands and wives struggle together without judgment, without insecurity, without anger, and without fear. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6 says that all is of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. I want you to notice in that verse, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, they're all in there together. So whether you struggle with lust or whether you lust for sugar, whether you've got a candy addiction, 
whether you're prideful, whether you're materialistic, whatever it is, these are the influences of the enemy that we need to confess, we need to get set free from, and we need not attack or judge the one who struggles with them. So again, when a man says, I struggle in this area, he is not saying, I don't love you. He is saying, I have an unhealthy appetite, and I need your help and support. And man, listen to me on this one. She can probably forgive the lust, but she's going to struggle a lot more to forgive the deception. So if you think, if you think uh, that, okay, I'm living this lie out, but I've got her snowballed, I've got her snookered, you are a fool. You're just a fool. Because she's going to find out, I guarantee it, and when she finds out, she's going to say, he's, he's a liar. He's a cheat. I can't even trust anything that man says. That's hard. But if you come to her and say, honey, I hate to confess this. I feel so horrible. But I struggle with lust. Here's what I've done. Would you stand with me to get set free? Man, that's a whole lot easier thing to forgive than that deceptive sneakiness. I want to close out with just a few scriptures. And we're going to actually stand and sing one last song together. I think it's going to be a healing song. We're going to open the front for an invitation for healing, emotional healing, physical healing, emotional healing. Uh, if this message impacted you, there is a, consume, a ring of consuming fire up here that can burn that right out of you as you come forward for prayer in humility. So don't worry about whether they're thinking you're coming front for physical healing because you got lust in your heart or whatever it is, whatever it is you need. Break through that stupid pride. See that thing broken off of you. Receive your physical healing. Receive your emotional healing. Talking about the eyes yet. Psalm 101 verse 3. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. Begins with the eyes. Proverbs 27, 20. Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of a man are never satisfied. Worship team, if you all come up here, we're going to sing here in a minute. Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of a man are never satisfied. That's that insatiable beast I was talking about. You'll never, you'll never meet that need through sexual immorality or pornography. Job says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? It's the looking that starts the whole process. Keep your eyes pure. I want to reread that passage from Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says, the eye is the lamp to the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. Man, right there it is. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be filled with darkness. Listen to me. If your eyes are bad, if you look upon darkness, your whole being will be filled with darkness. When you shine the light, your whole body is filled with light. I know this morning this was a tough message. I get that. Many of us here this morning, we struggle in this area. But I want you to know it's okay to struggle, but let's struggle together. And as we struggle together, we're going to get that splinter out of your finger. It's going to heal back over, and you're going to be whole. Let's get those splinters out. Let's don't, let's don't live in pain, pus forming around that splinter in our finger festering in our lives when it doesn't need to be let's struggle together let's stand together brothers and sisters would you all stand with me this morning we're going to sing this last song powerful song holy holy is the lord as we sing this song together i'm going to invite the worship uh, the um, prayer ministry team to the front and uh, i'd like many 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 of you respond for physical healing emotional healing healing in this area we've been talking about this morning, whatever it may be. Let's go ahead and sing this song.
burn out anything that's of unholiness, God. Holy ground. thank you for the holy purifying work you're doing god where you're purifying physical bodies emotional needs god purifying us from any darkness that would be in us thank you for the purification work that's going on right now in your holiness i thank you for the consuming fire that burns away anything that wouldn't be of you across the front right here this morning God, I thank you for the good work you're doing. Thank you that you're a good father, leading us into goodness and, and holiness and, and purity and righteousness because you, God, desire what's best for us. So we love you, Lord. We thank for your holiness. And God, we desire to fulfill the scripture that tells us to be holy even as I am holy, says the Lord. Thank you for this time. God, I pray that the work that you're doing in hearts and minds, God, would really resonate God, it would not be quickly forgotten. It would be walked out this coming week in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We're going to continue to do ministry across this front. If you haven't yet come for prayer, I encourage you to just fill these aisles as, these, as it opens up. We'll pray for you. The rest of you, feel free to uh, be on your way if you need to. But I encourage many of you to continue to respond for prayer as we continue to minister. Go in the favor of the Lord be blessed. See you next week.